Perfect, perfect song for this morning. My talk title isn't The Greening of Yourself. It's Waiting for Tomorrow, and yet the song is absolutely perfect. It speaks to the one mind that there is because of what's happening in the Amazon. We're blessing the beasts and the vegetation and the nature and, and surrounding that entire um, event in love. And we're celebrating our children today, so thank you for that beautiful song, Chris. Before I get into my talk, I just want to take another moment and look around. Just say thank you. Grateful to be here, grateful for the invitation to be here. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to share um, this week, for some reason this talk title just kept coming up for me. Because I think sometimes we wait. And I think sometimes the storms that come into our life maybe help us in ways we don't expect. Maybe they help clear something or help us experience something or maybe have an, a different experience. So I'm going to start with the Sufi parable. It's called The Merchant with Four Wives. And bear with me, it's a little bit long, but I really, if you think about what the words speak to you as I share this story, it'll make it a little more personal. So I'm going to invite you to drop down into that heart space. It says... Once upon a time, there lived a rich merchant with four wives. He loved his fourth wife the most of all. He adorned her with robes and jewels and treated her to delicacies. He took great care of her and gave her nothing but the best that he could offer. He also loved the third wife very much. He was very proud of her and always wanted to show her off to his friends. However, the merchant always lived in great fear that she might run off. He too loved his second wife. She was very considerate, always patient, and was the merchant's most trusted confidant. Whenever the merchant faced some problems, he always turned to his second wife, and she would help him through those difficult times. Now, the merchant's first wife was very loyal, nice, kind, patient, and considerate. She has made many great contributions to him throughout his life with his wealth and his business, as well as taking care of the household. However, the merchant did not love his first wife, and although she loved him deeply, he hardly took notice of her. Then one day, the merchant fell ill. After meeting with many of the greatest doctors in the land, he knew that he was going to die. He thought long and hard of his rich and luxurious life and told himself, Now I have four wives with me. But when I die, I'll be alone. How lonely will I be? So he went and met with his fourth wife. He asked her, I loved you most, endowed you with the finest clothing, and showered great care over you. Now that I'm dying, will you follow me and keep me company? No way, she replied. No, now I need to go out and find myself another husband. And she walked away without another word. The answer cut like a sharp knife deep into the merchant's heart. The sad merchant then turned to his third wife. I have loved you so much for all of my life, he said. Now that I'm dying, will you follow me and keep me company? No, not at all, replied the third wife. Life is so good over here. I'm having so much fun. Why should I spoil it? Now I have to go meet with my lawyers. <laughs> and the merchant's heart sank and turned cold. The merchant then asked his second wife, I always turn to you for help, and you've always helped me out. Now I need your help again. When I die, will you follow me and keep me company? What do you think she said? <laughs> I am sorry, but I cannot help you this time. I have so many other things to do. I can only send you to your grave. The answer came like a bolt of thunder, and the merchant was devastated. Then the merchant heard a voice. I will leave with you. I will follow you wherever you go. He looked up and saw his first wife standing nearby. She was so thin and pale and looked so weak standing there that she almost looked as if she had suffered from malnutrition. With his heart full of sorrow, the merchant cried and said, 
I should have taken so much better care of you when I could have. Well, we're all the merchant and we all have four wives because these wives represent four different things. The fourth wife represents our status, our possessions, and our wealth. When we die, they go to all others. The third wife is our body. No matter how much time and effort we lavish towards making it beautiful and healthy, it will leave us when we die. The second wife is our family, our friends. No matter how close they are to us when we're alive, they can only be with us up until the grave. But the first wife, the first wife is our soul. It's often neglected in our pursuit of material wealth and pleasures, while in truth, it is the only thing that follows us wherever we go. And the time to love that first wife is now. And that's what leads up to my talk about waiting for tomorrow. Don't wait for tomorrow when everything happens in the now. We teach in our philosophy the present moment. Ernest Holmes says, we should believe that God is the invisible partner in our lives and affirm that divine love goes before us and prepares the way. So if divine love prepares us for the way and guides and directs us, we have to listen. Do we open our hearts to stand in our truth right now, or are we waiting for tomorrow? Are we waiting for something else to happen? Are we waiting to accomplish this, or get this, or get that? It's kind of like destination anxiety. We're never happy. But we have this very moment. Stay in the present moment, being who we are, who we're called to be. What is it that we want to set an intention for? In a short bit of time, not much longer, we'll be asking our children, our youth, to share their intention for the new year. And we'll be supporting them in that intention. What if we also create our own intentions? Do that same homework assignment in our own lives. Maybe it's an intention that we set for ourselves. Maybe it's an intention we set with spirit within. Maybe it's an intention we set with our colleagues. Stephen Covey says you can have more than one intention. Write them down with the different people you're setting those intentions with. But the most important one is the setting the intention with yourself and your higher power, your spirit within. We use a lot of words for God in our faith. Love, law, divine presence, wisdom, abundance, joy, beauty. Whatever word speaks to you, maybe it's Buddha or Kuan Yin or the Christ, whatever that word is that calls forth to you, allow that intention to seep deep into you so you embody it with your whole being. They say the longest 18 inches is from your head to your heart. I can keep something up here really well. I can read all kinds of books and meditations, but until I embody it here, I'm waiting for tomorrow. I haven't felt that as ever. Juanita calls it that click. When I feel that click, I know it's the divine expressing itself through us. What a gift. How important is that? Ernest Holmes also says, we are thinking, willing, knowing, conscious centers of life. We are surrounded by, immersed in, and there is flowing through us a creative something, call it what you will. It wants to have its way within, through, and as us. That's why we're here. We come to church on Sundays to be raised up, to be lifted up, to be enfolded. And Reverend Peggy used to call it bringing a spiritual feast, that we have something that will nourish us, whether it's the music, which for many years is what really brought it to me. For years, I worked in youth church, so I didn't get to hear the Sunday morning message. But I got to hear the music, usually, somehow, or I'd listen to it on the CD. I think they, that back then we had CDs. Uh, we didn't have Facebook Live. Um, and it was amazing gifts. Sometimes it was the book of the month. The Science of Mind magazine, which I'll be reading to you in a little bit, that is also a huge area of connecting to us in our own spiritual practice. As many of you know, I love Rick Springfield. He turned 70 on Friday. Yeah, I hope I look that good at 70. But I want to share a lyric that really speaks to me in what we're talking about today. He has a song and there's a lyric that says, it's the deepest cuts who make us who we are. And he talks about the scars being that which takes us with it, that keeps us with him. But the truth is 
it's those deepest cuts that make us who, are, who we are, the scars. None of us leave without a scar. That's the other half of the lyric. I couldn't think of it. Um, but those scars don't have to keep us stuck. They can show where we've been and where we want to go because we all have them. We all have things that happen in our world. We have those storms that come through. But do they define us? Or do they give us the spiritual nourishment to keep moving forward to whatever it is we want to do, what we're feeling called to do? As I was mentioning in the Science of Mind magazine, I love the daily guides. And in this one, it's called Bumper Sticker Truths. I don't know about you, but I can resonate with this story. It's from August 30th, so you might not have gotten to it yet if you're following me along in the Science of Mind magazine. She says, um, this story changed my life, and I trust it will offer some insight for you as well. It calls us to a greater purpose as enlightened rebels. A lady was driving down Main Street in a rush. She was coming up to a traffic light turning yellow, and the guy in front of her slammed on his brakes. She was furious. She blew her horn a few times, offered a few not-so-nice hand signals. She was full of rage. A police officer saw what was going on and pulled up behind her, ultimately taking her to jail. <laughs> a couple of hours later, he came to her jail cell and told her she was free to leave. And she said, I appreciate it, sir. However, I still don't know what I did wrong. What do you think his response was? He responded, well, you have to see it from my point of view. On the back of your car, you have all of these bumper stickers like, let there be peace on earth. <laughs> Global oneness. <coughs> Love the world. And my favorite, mom's club against anger. <laughs> so I assumed you were driving a stolen car. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good one. Too many times we have allowed our lives to be stolen from us by a moment, an incident, an argument, or a misunderstanding. We are living in a time that we need to be congruent with our message and live in such a way that reminds the children that we believe in change and are an advocate for a world of peace. Physical life has an expiration date. Are we listening? Are we letting these stolen moments kind of guide our life? Instead of realizing in those stolen moments, we have an opportunity to anchor into the truth. We might course correct. We might realize we're doing something differently. We might find a way to turn within and start listening, and maybe finding there's something else calling forth that wants to come through, but maybe we're scared or we're afraid. But do we find that opportunity to step into that space and say yes? Say yes. And then maybe find another bumper sticker for my car. Because we're human. We're going to have those moments where we feel these this way, that we act in certain ways that maybe we're not happy about. I was sharing with somebody once, and I said, I might love somebody, but I don't like their behavior in that moment. And that's sometimes how I feel about myself. There's self-love, but there's also an opportunity to do things differently if it's not working for us. So I invite us to really anchor into that knowing us that there is a divine expression wanting to have its way in through and as each and every one of us. And I'm grateful to be here this morning. I invite us to turn within in prayer. And just give thanks. And recognizing and knowing in this very moment there is only God. There in this very moment there is that life that wants to have its way within, through, and as each and every one of us. One life, one God, one presence. It is my life right now. Instead of waiting for tomorrow, I step into the present moment, into the now. When I step into the now, I'm calling forth a presence greater than I am that dwells deep within me to guide and direct my life, my actions, my choices, my words. And there's a space of uncertainty. I sit in the pause and listen until I hear the words of guidance, however that is for each one of you. In that space of absolutely knowing there's a divine expressing itself, I look to the eyes of my beloved, 
to my friends, family, strangers, and see the voice, see the presence of God. I hear the voice of God in their words. When I come from that space of being anchored in truth and anchored in knowingness, I am one with the planet, one with nature, one with life, one with our four-legged, our two-legged, all of the beautiful life that is present on our planet, including our planet. It is alive. And it is breathing, as each and every one of us are. And as we set that intention for love and for light and for peace in this moment, I absolutely notice the divine saying yes. With a grateful heart filled with joy and gratitude, I release my word into the law, where I know it is done. I let it be, and so it is. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you.